One of the experiences I trust every homebrewer shares is the feeling of awe that comes from witnessing the conversion of wort into beer through the fermentation process. Even after 15 years, I still get giddy when I see the first signs of airlock activity, a nice fluffy croissant developing on top of my beer. The worst is when this takes too long. You all know the anxiety that comes from checking on a batch a day after pitching and seeing no action. This is why we love Imperial Yeast, who pack 200 billion cells of the purest yeast into each pitch right pouch, which assures quick starts, healthy fermentation, and predictably great results. I strongly urge all of our listeners to check out everything Imperial Yeast has to offer and let them know that you appreciate their support of the Brewlosophy podcast while you're at it. All right, on to the show. Ask any brewer what ingredients are required to make beer, and they'll swiftly let you know water, hops, yeast, and of course, barley. Indeed, just these alone can be used to produce a wide variety of styles ranging in color, strength, and flavor, but there are certainly other cereal grains that can also be used in beer for a number of purposes. You're listening to the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott, and today I'm joined by contributor Will Lovell to chat about a rather unique brewing ingredient, malted blue corn. So I really like corn as a brewing ingredient because, you know, if you look at the brewing tradition, most of that that we talk about comes from Europe. But, uh, you know, corn is a cereal grain that came from the Americas. Like it's 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 technically ours, right? Like it's it's been (laughs) over here for a long time. So it's really cool that we get to play this ingredient that's indigenous to the Americas. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I definitely went through a phase, albeit very briefly, where, you know, I scoffed at Big Beer's use of corn in their product. But that all went away when I learned how awesome this ingredient really is, kind of like you will. I mean, cream ale wouldn't even exist without it. And I love me a crisp, cold cream ale. I've also used corn in a bunch of other styles with no reservation, though it's usually been of the flaked yellow or even grits varieties. Uh, I've never personally seen blue corn, or at least the type you might brew with, uh, especially that's been malted. So I look forward to learning more about this with you today. All right, if you're a fan of this show and you would like to receive a reward for your support, consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy, where you make a small pledge and receive rewards like access to unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invitation to a monthly live Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world. Coming up in February of 2024, Dana Garvis, founder of Oregon Brew Lab, will be hanging out with patrons. In addition to being an accomplished home brewer, Dana is a trained brewing chemist who helped build the quality control lab at Ninkasi Brewing Company before starting her own company in 2016. Oregon Brew Lab offers a variety of essential analyses for affordable prices to both commercial and home brewers. We've had the pleasure of working with Oregon Brew Lab many times over the years, and Dana is truly an incredible member of the brewing community. I'm really looking forward to this session. If you'd like to be a part of it, you got to make your pledge of just $3 or more by Friday, February 23rd, 2024, as Dana is going to be taking questions on Saturday the 24th. All past sessions are stored on our private Facebook and Patreon pages so folks can go back and watch them whenever they like. Again, that's patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Another really easy way to help help us out is to uh, use the links found at brewlosophy.com slash support when you're shopping online. Your shopping experience doesn't change at all and we get a little kickback for the referral. All right, feedback is brought to you by Clawhammer Supply, who offer brewers various options for high quality, reasonably priced electric brewing rigs in various voltages and sizes. I've used their 120 volt system for five gallon batches, as well as their 240 volt 10 gallon setup, and both really are awesome. Clawhammer Supply really puts the effort into ensuring their systems do exactly as they're intended to do in as efficient a way as possible. If you're not ready to make the jump to electric just yet, they also sell 10 and 20 gallon brew in a bag home brewing starter kits. Whatever it is you're looking for, do yourself a favor and visit clawhammersupply.com. We're confident you'll love their stuff just as much as we do. All right, our good friend William Babcock, the dude responsible for plying my friends and me with a bunch of East Coast beers a few weeks back, uh, wrote in with some feedback after listening to our recent episode on using cheap juice to make hard cider. Will said, "Uh, believe it or not, even living 30 miles outside of New York City, there are still several apple orchards and cider mills within a 15-minute drive of me here in New Jersey. So when I decided to make my first couple of batches of hard cider, I, of course, went and bought six gallons of fresh-pressed, unpasteurized juice to the tune of $8 per gallon. The first few batches came out well, but not amazing, and they look they took forever to clear up. While sleuthing the googies, <laughs> I stumbled upon the Brulosophy Mixed Berry Hard Cider Recipe using store-bought apple juice. What the funk? Uh, I tried it anyway and can say it's the best batch of cider I have made yet. I've never used the, quote, juice with no name brand, uh, but if I can get juice from Costco for a fraction of the price and it tastes just 
just as good, if not better than using fresh cider? Yeah, I'm doing that. Just my anecdotal proverbial two cents. Whiskey Will, been a long time, man. I hope you're doing good. Um, but I I can't, um, you know, I, I think it's kind of like store-bought juice. I don't know, maybe this is a horrible uh, analogy, but it's kind of like getting like pre-made wort versus like going out there and kind of mixing and matching. So I think I think if you are a tune or if you have a, a nice, uh, you know, hand that can walk alongside you and hold your hand while you go out and pick these apples <laughs> and get the right juice. I feel like you have more levers if you can go to these different apple orchards and like kind of get to know these different apples, right? Because, you know, you can pick whether you want your semi-sweet or, or more bitter apples, you know, to make this this very custom product. That said, the easy button on this is delicious and I'm with Will. I, there's nothing wrong with the easy button. I think it's great, but I, it would be cool if I could go like, you know, with some, some wise cider maker of, of somewhere and like go pick out apples and things. Cause I think that'd be really fun. But, um, yeah, me going out there by myself, it would be, it would be stupid, but and buying juice, <laughs> who, who knows what you're getting. Yeah. I, so here's my thoughts on this. First off, I have a feeling that most uh, apple orchards are probably growing table apples. So your classic Fuji, Red Delicious, Gala, you know, your sweet table apples that people munch on for lunch or for a snack, whatever. Uh, If you talk to, to like hardcore cider makers, those aren't the apples that they're necessarily interested in, or at least using those on their own, right? They're, they're blending in apples that have more acidity or more tannin character, uh, stuff like that. So do I think that, that you have, like you said, Will, do you have more lever? to pull if you're going about it the the more traditional fresh pressed route yes but only if you have access to these farms that have these these different varieties of apples to make your cider with Uh, if you're just going to a farm that's growing the same apples that ultimately end up in the juice that you buy at costco then i don't see i I get the romanticism behind it i you know you do you if, if that makes you feel better by all means keep doing it but but I don't think it's going to have that huge of a flavor impact. Uh, that's at least been what you know what we've been able to kind of show a little bit. So yeah, Will, I'm with you. Uh, you know, like I said in that episode, I, I've had cider made with these different apples in various ways and naturally fermented and all that. But my favorite has always been the cheap ones that I make with store bought cider. And I'm sure I know for a fact many people disagree, and that's perfectly fine. But if you are looking for something different than beer that doesn't take a lot of time. Go to the store and pick up some apple, cheap old apple juice, uh, throw some yeast in it and see see what comes of it. Now, I also do have a, this is another aside on the apple juice thing. I do think that if you are making more of a dry wine-like cider, um, that you're not back sweetening, it, back sweetening it for people who may not really, you know, like that, the, the more foofy style of, of, of wine tasting apple cider, then you're probably going to, you know, your mileage is going to go a little further uh, with fresh pressed, you know, these, these more boutique types of, apple, of apples. But man, I, I've yet to have a store-bought apple juice cider that I haven't enjoyed. So your mileage may vary, as they say. So thank you for hitting us up, Will. Uh, we always appreciate hearing from you. If you have show feedback, you could send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com or drop us a note on social media. We are officially back to weekly episodes of the Brewlosophy show, which is super exciting. Martin has put so much time and effort into building this YouTube channel, and he's got some really cool stuff in store for the future that we're confident everyone listening to this show is going to love uh, just as much as you like this podcast. Uh, you can find it by going to youtube.com slash at the Brew philosophy show or simply searching YouTube for brewlosophy. We also started publishing this podcast as well as the brew lab over on YouTube again for various reasons. If you are a Google podcast user, you're going to be forced to start using YouTube music. So we had to make that change swiftly. Make sure you subscribe to the brewlosophy show so you're notified when new episodes drop. When we're back from this break, our focus will be on the use of malted blue corn in a pale lager. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately, I settled on the super-efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort, from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature, in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com. And be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. 
As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to yakimavalleyhops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. When I think of corn as a brewing ingredient, my mind immediately goes to cream ale and commercial American lager, of course, only because those are perhaps the styles most known to rely on this unique ingredient. However, it can be used in quite a few styles for a number of reasons. Will, why don't we start with a brief overview of corn in general, as well as the uh, as in the context of brewing? Well, you know, when I think of corn, I think of uh, driving down nice Texas roads with like, you know, some some truck on the side of the road selling a bunch of bushels out of the back of it. And that's where (laughs) you usually get the good stuff. Uh, But, you know, as far as it comes, I mean, corn is actually a technically a grass, which isn't all that different from barley and wheat, which are also technically, you know, cereal grains that come from grasses. And, you know, as I mentioned at the top of the show, it's really cool because it's a cereal grain that is, you know, native to the Americas. So while we may borrow all these other things from all these other places, this is unique to us, which is pretty awesome. Heck yeah. I love that too, that, that it's, it's, you know, and, and what are the odds that the thing that comes from the country we live in is determined to be the cheap, the cheap out, you know what I mean? Like, oh, there's corn in it, so it can't be that good. Well, I, I, I disagree. So uh, there are a couple of varieties of corn. Obviously, the stuff that we're eating at the dinner table is going to be a sweeter, higher sugar content corn. That's not typically the stuff that's used for more downstream corn products. The stuff that we eat at the table has about a 10% sugar content and tastes very obviously sweet. Uh, They refer to it as sweet corn. In fact, uh, I, we're kind of similar to, it sounds like, to where you're at, uh, Will, in, here in Fresno. We have, uh, Fresno State University has a, you know, an agronomics program and farming programs and stuff like that. And so we get, uh, I think a couple times a year, we get access to the sweet corn that the Fresno State students grow, and it's phenomenal. Uh, everybody here, it's kind of like the the pro- one of the pr- Fresno's prides, right, is this corn that we have access to here. That's not necessarily the stuff we're going to be brewing with, though. Um, that comes from what they refer to as field corn, um, which is that that's the stuff that's used to make, you know, these other de- I call them downstream products like grits or flaked maize, um, corn syrup, corn flakes, corn chips, stuff like that. It's not as sweet, has about 4% sugar content by my understanding. And I believe it's a softer kernel that has more starch as well. Yeah, and if you've ever, um, I've actually hit the truck that was selling field corn instead of uh, sweet corn as well, and it, it's not it's not near as good. It's not what you expect when you pull it off the grill. That's what I'll say. <laughs> I've done the same thing where you where because just because we have access to so much, we we live in a farming region here in Fresno, and I've taken a bite just for fun of the like corn maize corn. You know, that's not always sweet corn, and yeah, it is just it's like a starch bomb. It's like biting into a potato. You know, a raw potato. It has that kind of a of a texture to it. Um, uh, but it, the another term that you're going to hear possibly in this episode, but when you're talking about corn is uh, is dent corn. Um, and I believe that is a type of field corn that's the most used or utilized uh, for making these downstream products. So just keep that in mind in terms of a terminology and such. Uh, so yeah, corn in brewing now, obviously it is a cereal grain, just like wheat and barley and rye. And my understanding is that all cereal grains can be malted, but of course it does come in other preparations as well. Yeah, so I think flaked maize, which is maize, also kind of the OG word for corn here in the Americas. Uh, I think flaked maize is definitely um, probably the most generally uh, used in brewing here. And and we know flaked maize, they take the corn, they steam it, they press it with rollers and flatten it out. And then now you have a pre-gelatinized um, kind of flake that you don't need a cereal mash for, which is pretty awesome. And this is, you know, when I think of corn and beer, flaked maize is probably one of the first things my mind goes to. It is without a doubt the t- it's the the preparation if you will of corn that I have used the most. Um, I've bought flaked maize by the 10 pounds and just keep, you know, keep it in bulk in my garage so that if I want to go make, you know, a an American lager or a cream ale or even a double IPA or something, which we'll talk about that kind of stuff in a minute, um, I can just go out and grab, you know, a pound or two 
included in my recipe and you don't have to worry about performing a cereal mash which you know all a cereal mash is basically is is cooking the this cereal the, the cereal grain prior to using it in your mash and it's just something that uh, allows to the the enzymatic so that you don't have to worry about the enzymatic conversion of those starches into uh into fermentable sugars if you don't do a cereal mash with un or or non pre-gelatinized i don't even know if that's a word uh cereal grains then it's not going to convert you're not going to get the sugars out of it like you might expect now some people are okay with that in certain applications so flaked maize fixes that. Uh, so you got this nice flat, it's it's a little bit smaller than a typical cornflake cereal, uh, but it's a flattened pre-gelatinized product that you can just toss right in your mash and it works great. Another preparation of corn is grits, which anybody who lives in the South <laughs> or people who like to experiment with regional uh, eating uh, know what grits are. I love them. Uh, they're just, a, the, the way that grits are made is that the hole from the corn is removed. The kernel is then dried and then ground into these really small bits that tastes, you know, they have kind of a gritty texture when they're cooked. Uh, quick grits are pre-gelatinized in the same way that flaked maize is. Uh, so that can be used in the same way as flaked maize. If you don't get the quick grits, I don't know what they would be called, traditional maybe, um, then you do, you know, it's recommended that you perform a cereal mash on, on those. Uh, but quick grits can be used in the same way that flaked maize is in brewing, which I've done that quite a bit as well. I started, I bought like a two pound bag or something like that for a, for a short and shoddy. It worked great. So I kept using it until it was gone. Um, but my experience with quick grits and flaked maize has been very positive. Yeah, um, when I think of quick grits, I think of those uh, cheesy grits that you can get with maybe some shrimp on top, and that's that's where I'm going with that. But um, yes, you can absolutely use them in beer. <laughs> So then the other preparation of corn, of course, is malted corn. Now, as, as I, I try to be as transparent as I possibly can, I've never seen or used malted corn, um, but we know it, it can be done and we know it's out there because we've got, we've got sponsors who make the stuff. So uh, in, in this application uh, or preparation, the corn is malted in the same way that other cereal grains can be malted. It's germinated by being kind of soaked in, in water uh, and then left out to sprout uh, uh, and then once that acrospire starts to show, uh, they dry the corn, they kiln it uh, to a relatively low level to stop that whatever's happening, right? Um, and then uh, you can use that corn in the same way, arguably or ostensibly, that you do malted barley or malted wheat or something like that. Um, by doing that malting, you're activating the enzymes that convert the starches to sugars uh, during the mash. So again, it's going to have you know some diastatic power. It's going to have the same or similar qualities as other malting grains which or malted right. grains, which I think is cool. And you hit that perfect. Like the, it does have, so unlike the, um, you know, the flaked corn, this does have some diastatic power, so it can self convert to some degree. Now it's probably not as efficient as uh, some other uh, formats out there, but it does have diastatic power, so it can self convert if it needs to. Yeah, exactly. And so if you know what the thing is, is you're. <laughs> I think chicha is a is a style. It's not beer technically, you know, by the, our our very conservative definition of beer. Uh, but it, chicha is a is like a Peruvian, I think, um, fermented beverage that's made purely with, if like a fermented malted corn product or something along those lines. Um, but typically in brewing applications, you're not going to use a hundred percent corn. Uh, so if you're using something like a malted blue corn with uh, even a handful of malted barley, you're going to get the enzymatic power that you need for for conversion. Um, but it is, you know, it's not going to be identical to barley. Now, I did read, I was doing some reading about this yesterday, and there are certain types of, uh, or certain stories, I suppose, that I've read of people who are getting very similar conversion to like six-row malt, which is a little bit lower than this hot two-row malt that we have access to today. So again, it can be used, to, you know, sort of, it can be used on its own. I just don't know any application application where somebody would do that, though, uh, if you're moving into the distilling world, then there's a different story there. Yeah, a lot of distillers um, talk about using malted blue corn. In fact, when when I was first was introduced to the ingredient and had some in my possession, like most of the information out there is from distilling forums and a lot of other stuff. And there's not a ton of great info about where to use it in brewing. Uh, but you know, when you when you have 50 pounds of it on hand, you get to do some experimenting, right? And so, uh, what do I have? I have malted blue corn. Um, and so, uh, blue corn, you know, that's just a, a field or dent corn. It's primarily used for foods such as tortillas. Um, fun fact, uh, Tex malt 
uh, who who sponsored me and gave me this this wonderful bag of blue corn. Um, they get it from uh, this this farm in North Texas. And when I talked to Nick, he was saying, "Oh yeah, um, we get it from this farm. And actually, the blue corn we get from this farm is the same same farm that provides the blue corn for most of the blue tortilla chips here in the South. So that's oh, pretty awesome. <laughs> that's way cool. The only that's actually I was going to say that the only form I've ever had blue corn in are in tortilla chips from Trader Joe's, <laughs> and they taste great. So you know, and who who's to say they wouldn't taste great? in a beer as well. Well, it's really cool that Tex Malt is actually making a product specifically for brewing with um, this malted blue corn, which has a beautiful kind of light blue, almost blueberry-ish kind of hue to it. And I think that's really rad. Um, before we t- talk about the impact that this malted corn has on beer, though, let's talk about some reasons somebody might choose to brew with malted corn in general, but also malted blue corn. Um, the, the first thing that comes to mind for me is kind of the old story, the, the commonly accepted you know, reason that American, uh, you know, big American brewers were relying on corn is just that it's cheaper and more accessible than brewing grains. It's, it doesn't cost as much as barley. It does because of the fact that it is so rampantly grown in uh, the United States and even Canada. Uh, access to it makes the price a lot cheaper. And if it's going to do essentially the same thing by contributing fermentable sugars with very minimal flavor impact, I mean, that was kind of the key, uh, then it's just cheaper. And, and and, and so why not? Yeah, I, I think the the main reason we started using corn to begin with, right? It, it's an American grown ingredient. And so uh, at some point when you when you're over here and all you've got, uh, you know, what what you've got, you know, corn seemed like an obvious substitute widely available. I don't know if it's still cheaper. I'd have to go look up the prices of malted blue corn versus uh, normal malts. Um, it is kind of now kind of a, a chic ingredient. It's yeah. kind of a you know, it, it's definitely something that's a little more, you have to be looking for it because there's only a few maltsers that I know of that malt blue corn. I know Tex malt and then I think Sugar Creek malting uh, are pretty, pretty known for it. So, um, but I do think in the beginning, you know, cost was definitely a factor. Yeah. To clarify my point, corn in general is highly accessible and highly cheap. Uh, you, you know, you can go to the grocery store and get quick grits and you can make a beer with quick grits for I mean, a lot cheaper than, you know, buying brewing grains. I mean, that's just that's just the way that works. Now, obviously, if if you're going to go buy some boutique malted blue corn, more power to you. I think you should because it supports small business that we love. Uh, But that's going to cost you about the same as making a regular beer, I suspect. So, but I, it, historically, the reason I think a lot of uh, brewers, at least in the in the states and the Americas over here, started using corn was because of the price. Uh, the, it also, though, has a nice impact on the. Uh, ultimately, this is going to be a weird comment, but it has a good impact on the end product because it doesn't have much of an impact at all, right? If we're looking for yellow, fizzy, almost flavorless, at least very clean, uh, pale lager beer, corn is an ideal product because it doesn't contribute much in the way or, you know, this is this is the experience or what's reported by the people who use it is that it doesn't have much of an impact at all on flavor or aroma. You're getting a nice boost to the strength of the beer without anything else getting in the way. So you can use it for very specific reasons uh, to not amplify flavor and aroma while still getting a nice uh, or even mouthfeel and body while still getting that nice ABV boost. Right. And I know uh, specifically for, you know, I, I have multiple blue corn, but for I've, I've definitely had more experience with flaked with flaked. It, it does kind of um, help lighten the color of it a little bit as well, just because it doesn't have that color contribution that other malts would have in there yeah. uh, while you get that boozy kick. So um, and, I, and I think in past experience, especially with flaked, I think it's shown to be a little little clearer and a little lighter. So I, I think that's a great way to do it. Um, corn also uh, could boost some strength while having minimal impact on body and mouthfeel. And so I think that's a great way to use it, especially since we associate corn with those uh, fizzy yellow lagers. I, th- I think it's a great ingredient to do that with. Well, yeah. And it's, you know, there are people when years and years and years ago, when I first was planning my first cream ale batch, uh, that was a that was a style for me that I actually shied away from making for a while because of the fact that it included this product that I, for, for a little while, about two or three years in my brewing, just kind of looked down upon, right? We snubbed our noses at corn because, ew, Bud Light, you know, or that's, excuse me, that's rice. Uh, Miller yeah. Light or, you know, big American beer. Why would you use corn? Yucky. Um, I, I've moved far away from those opinions. Um, but but I did, you know, when when I was talking about making these cream ales and, and trying out and I bought that first, you know, bulk batch of corn, 
comments came in like, ooh, it's going to taste like DMS, you know, that's because that's what we associate with corn or that's what I read on some forum at least. Uh, you're, it's going to taste like piss beer because that's what, you know, the big brewers use. And it, I did not experience that. In the hundreds of times that I've brewed with corn, I have not experienced any of the downsides that people, uh, you know, claim or, or could happen if you use corn. To me, it really does just impart a nice, clean... It's it's just kind of like a level up in terms of the strength without adding much character in general. So I was curious again, w- what is malted blue corn? Because all of my experiences with either grits or or even more so uh, flaked maize, you know, is there going to get... Are you going to get something different out of a malted version uh, of a corn product? You know, um, I... I would assume just because there is a little bit more kilning involved, there's a little bit more of a, a mailer reaction that you would you would think would have maybe a little bit more character. Um, but you know the the ones I've had with with uh, malted corn, I wouldn't say gave it a corny flavor at all. So uh, so I think that's kind of a little bit overblown. And I and again I'm gonna keep hammering on this because we need to flip the script. This is our new world ingredient. This is our new world tradition. We really need to just embrace this ingredient for what it is. Yeah, if we're gonna if we're gonna pretend to hate something because of the fact that it's used by people that. You you're also pretending to hate. Well, that's that, that's we can go down that rabbit hole later. But I, I just refuse to jump on that boat. I've learned my lesson. Uh, you know, learn through experience, I, I suppose. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the technical specs, uh, specifically of the Tex Malt Blue Corn that we were able to find. At least there's not much out there on malted corn in general. Uh, but the PPG, the points per pound per gallon, is right around for malted blue corn, mind you, is right around 1039 SG or 39, um, which isn't too far off from malted barley, which I believe is around 30. 37 or 10 or 1037 SG PPG. Um, not, not too different. In fact, arguably, uh, you can get a little bit more out of, uh, you know, malted corn than you might out of barley malt, which I thought was interesting. So, um, one other spec to look at if you go to like the the tax malt website i don't know that they list things in as as you know ppg points per gallon um, but they do li- list the fine extract percentages and if you look at their um pilsner malt the fine extract percentage which again is kind of a highball extract percentage is, is around um 80 and then if you go down to like um blue corn you're looking more at around 40 percent or so 40 42 percent so it, it doesn't quite have the same um extract percentage as barley um so you so when you do add it you're not going to get as much yield from it as you might with say even flaked corn um so that is something to keep in mind when you're designing recipes around this yeah that's that's an interesting point and to clarify uh the i i was just realizing that the tech spec technical specs that i just shared are from malted corn in general so you know each maltsters the the way the, the their process and the way that they do their malting can have an impact on the ultimate you know, extract efficiency of their malted grains. Uh, so it, yeah, the, the best way to find out though is to use it for yourself, right? And to go off the specs, I, I tend to trust, uh, you know, the, the specs that the person selling, the maltster is telling me. So uh, these are more general. What you shared is a bit more specific. So in terms of the color, uh, the malted blue corn is going to be between 1.8 and 2.0 Lovabond. Now, despite being visibly blue and having this blue hue, I don't believe that they that any maltster is claiming that it's going to contribute a blue color to your beer. And it, it doesn't. <laughs> so just so you no, know. It, it looks really cool when you hold it in your hands, <laughs> but it does not contribute that color. Kind of unfortunate, honestly. I wish it did. Totally. I mean, that would be rad, right? Like a beer, a blue beer that doesn't taste like berries or anything. But uh, it does have a a similar uh, color, you know, predictability, if you will, uh, as as like a pale malt. You know, right around that one point eight to two point level bond, maybe even like a, a a pilsner malt. So you're not really adding much in the way of color, which is something to keep in mind when you're designing a recipe. Uh, in terms of the amount that you're supposed to use or that's recommended in terms of like a max uh, maximum usage rate. It's corn, so it's it can be used in the same way that any other corn product is, which arguably could be up to 100% of the grist if that's what you wanted. Uh, you are moving out of the realm of beer at that point, which is fine. But I think most people are looking at about 10 to 20% for cream ale or American lager or something like that. But you can get up to 50% or so to really kind of thin out uh, a beer without contributing much in the way of flavor or aroma. Yeah, even on the distillers forums, I don't think most of them are using 100% malted corn. Usually when they're doing malted corn with their distilling, it's it's still at a 
you know, something less than 50% typically, yeah. um, at least for me, me kind of sleuthing around on those forums. Cause again, there's not a ton of data in the brewing world for malted corn, but there's a lot of data in the distilling world. So, yeah. Oh yeah. I watch, uh, there's some d- cool distilling shows on discovery channel that I've been watching. And yeah, it sounds to me like they're, they're in that kind of 50, 50 realm. Um, in order to make a good corn liquor, you got to have enough corn to call it corn liquor. Right. So, um, but yeah, I very rarely do. I, my understanding is that they're using hundred percent corn mash. Or, or something like that. So now we already went over this a little bit, but there are some arguments from, uh, you know, certain aspects or areas of the brewing world against the use of corn. Typically, those arguments sound like this. Uh, it cheapens the beer. You're stripping it of the wonderful flavors of other cereal grains that deserve far more attention. Uh, it adds an undesirable corny flavor reminiscent of DMS. Any other uh, arguments against it that you've heard before, Will? <laughs> So the the only thing I would say from my own experience of using blue corn is it, it's kind of a it, it's really hard like you don't you get it in your hand and at least the stuff I have it's like super hard and so you know you kind of want to maybe crack it a little bit just to you know get it to get more of the inside to more of the good stuff and more of the enzymes um, and so like to do that you either have to really adjust your grain mill which if you have a really nice three roller mill I don't recommend running it through there or you can you know do some other things like use a food processor use a uh, buy a corn mill that you can kind of adjust the coarseness on. And, and that's kind of an extra step that you have to take just for corn versus if you just went with an all barley beer. Yeah. 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 I mean, like I said, I've never used malted corn um, flaked the flaked adjunct, uh, the, the grits, those again, you don't even have to mill that stuff. So uh, if you're using malted corn or malted blue corn, be sure to, to think about how you want to get that stuff cracked. And, and if someone out there has a better method, I, by all means, I'm all ears. Um, maybe I'm cracking it all in vain, but, but, but please let me know. <laughs> uh, I see, I would have been the dum dum who just ran it through my mill uh, to see what, I mean, I would just presume that my mill can handle it. So uh, I've never had a grain get stuck above the rollers, uh, but I've heard that that can happen with larger kerneled malted grains. So uh, maybe corn's one of those. Now, in the experiment we're going to talk about in the next segment, you did focus on pale lager, and and we often choose the style with the hope of really accentuating the variable that we're testing out. So because of that, uh, the BJCP provides the following description of a pale lager. It's a highly attenuated pale lager without strong flavors, typically well-balanced and highly carbonated, uh, served cold. It's a refreshing and thirst-quenching. So so it, this is an international pale lager, uh, to correct myself there. And typically, you know, you look at international pale lagers, I think they're they're usually made with a, a touch of rice. Uh, you know, I, I tend to associate that style with things like Asahi and Sapporo. So why not try it out with a little bit of corn? I would imagine that that'd be a good way, you know, for as clean as that beer style is to, to really test the impact of the you know, flavor of the perceptible impact of, of malted blue corn. Yeah, um, and and corn, at least in the Americas, has a long tradition inside of lager brewing, um, and so why not use a a lager? Um, I, I know it's an international pale lager, just because we got to make it fall into some kind of BJCP guideline <laughs> to talk right. about. But uh, but you know why why not do a nice lager? Why not do something that we can just you know basically let the corn shine if it's going to? Yep. Well, like I said before, I've never used malted corn in my own brewing. Uh, I've used flaked maize and grist and grits uh, many many times, usually at around fifteen to twenty percent of the grist as a means of boosting uh, the strength of the beer while maintaining a light, crisp mouthfeel in styles like double IPA and various types of pale lager. Well, after learning about malted corn, I was super interested in the impact it has on beer. And Will, you got your hands on some Tex Malt Blue Corn Malt and decide, uh, decided to design an experiment to see for yourself the impact it has on beer. Results from that when we're back from this break. There's no denying that stainless steel is the best material for brewing equipment, and Delta Brewing Systems offers some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which in addition to holding 8 gallons or 30 liters of work, comes with a domed lid to even further reduce the chances of a messy blow-off. Plus, it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure for closed transfers. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles, as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brewing systems out there, and their prices are shockingly low. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear that won't break the bank, Do yourself a favor and head over to deltabrewingsystems.com today. 
Have you ever thought about adding a port to your kettle but held off because you didn't feel like drilling into your gear or sending it off to have someone else do it? From the makers of the world's fastest counterflow chiller, the Exchillerator, comes the Hangover. The easiest way to add extra ports to your kettle as well as countless other options. Mount a faucet to your keg for easy portable pouring. Set up the perfect whirlpool arm. Hold a heating element in place. All of this and so much more without permanently modifying your gear. Manufactured right here in the United States, The Hangover offers brewers too many convenient solutions to list here. So head over to Exchillerator.com today to see what The Hangover can do for you. I have no qualms admitting that I love beers that are made with corn. Whether it's crushable double IPA or an ice cold Miller Lite, just give it to me and I'll drink it. Doesn't bother me whatsoever. That said, I'm not too sure I've ever had a beer made with malted corn, uh, particularly of the blue variety, like the stuff you got from Tex Malt a while back, Will. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, this was one of the first times I've ever brewed with blue corn, and I was so glad that they gave me the opportunity to use this ingredient. It's so unique. It's so kind of, I mean, they get it from Texas farm, so as a Texan, you know, I have to love that. So I was super excited to dive into this and kind of explore what this had to offer. And so uh, to do that, we, we of course, chose a pale lager. Um, I did two five-gallon batches of international pale lager. Um, one batch was made with 100% Tex malt, Lano Pilsner malt, while the other one was made with 82% Lano Pilsner malt with 18% malted blue corn. So tell me a little bit about the the decision to settle on 18%. Because, you know, from my thinking, if I'm reading this blind and I wasn't a part of the design, <laughs> um, I'm looking and saying that's a, that's a nice in between, you know, from 15 to 20, which is the recommended, you know, usage rate uh, for, for blue corn, for blue corn in general, uh, for styles like this. So, um, for one reason, it came out to a nice even two pounds when I was measuring it out. So that's kind of fun. I, I'm one of those weird people that um, I don't go by percentages exactly. I tend to like round to the nearest pound. So, uh, so that's kind of just goes with my thing. And then also, you know, I've never used this ingredient, so I didn't necessarily want to push it too far outside of acceptable limits. And from reading around, um, 18% seemed like a pretty in some cases over the top amount for a lot of people brewing with this uh, ingredient. So I, I felt like it was in a pretty good spot. Yeah, certainly enough, in my opinion, to be able to taste or smell or feel in your mouth the impact of this product. I mean, 18% of your grist when the rest is just Pilsner malt, that, that was fair to me. Right. And so, again, ho hopefully with the large amount of Pilsner malt, again, 82%, blue corn, again, pale lager. So hopefully we're setting up a recipe to where if it is going to shine, hopefully hopefully it shines through um, with this, this amount. So um, for the brewing process, I did uh, two full volume uh, mashes in my Delta all-in-one brewing systems. Um, the blue corn malt had to be pulverized in a food processor first because uh, it was a little harder than the barley malt and i have a really nice you know three roller monster mill and i didn't really want to um kind of take a chance on making that stuff go through it and <laughs> the people the people that i have i have read about that have had success had to adjust their gaps to be wider just because it's so big mm. i've read about some people kind of boogering up mills so it got me a little a little sketchy so i'm like you know what i got this old food processor my wife was talking about giving away anyway so i won't make her too mad <laughs> <laughs> so i mashed both at about 154 degrees uh, fahrenheit for 60 minutes uh, when the mashes were complete i removed the grains and proceeded to boil the wort for 60 minutes uh, and then i went on to my hop additions which turned out to be 28 grams of Herzbrucker at 60 minutes 10 grams of Herzbrucker at 30 minutes and 10 grams of Herzbrucker at five minutes so far this has sounded like a delicious beer to me i was just gonna say this is this is an ideal you know basic simple international pale lager now typically it's at this point uh or i guess back at the mash now you said you mashed it about 154 f or 68 c um it, i don't know if there's a reason you chose that temperature to me that's like your perfect midline alpha and beta you know um uh, those are the the your amylase enzymes you're, you're activating both of those at a nice middle ground typically when i make international pale lager i'm going somewhere down in one to, between like 146 and 148 which i believe would be around 65c or so um is there a reason you chose 154 is it, was it because of the fact that you you knew that this this pilsner malt was going to be highly convertible anyways or um so i kind of went 154 just you know usually by default i'm doing either 152 or 154 and so i was kind of running on autopilot truth be told so we just kind of got it going and, and got it moving and 154 is kind of where we landed for the day so yeah um so wh why fight it? it it's a good temperature um in my experience again with the the dryness of beer that usually comes more from your water chemistry more so than uh 
than perhaps your mash temperature. So, but yeah. 154 seemed like a good spot to me. No, yeah, I'm with you. The water chemistry um, creates the impression of dryness. Mash temperature creates the belief of dryness. <laughs> it's kind of this this thing that I've fallen on lately is like, man, we, you know, the, the we've talked about millions of times in the past, but the long chain dextrins that are uh, remain when you mash warm may not necessarily be as perceptibly sweet as a lot of people believe. So 154, it works for me. I love your your choice of Hersbrucker, a really nice, not too in your face noble hop or you know, German hop that is going to contribute the more classic, you know, earthy, spicy, floral characteristics, but not not too pungently. Um, this is sounding, like you said, uh, just a great, uh, nice pale lager in the end. Now, like I was saying, this is the point in the, during the mash or during the boil where I'm also considering uh, adjunct additions. Am I going to throw in some corn sugar? Am I going to throw in some minute rice or rice solids or rice syrup? Um, and so in your case, you mashed because it was malted corn. You just mashed with all of that corn in the mash versus a batch that was made with 100% Pilsner malt instead. Exactly. And I went single infusion, you know, maybe down the road, it'd be interesting to see if you did kind of a cereal mash and then ramped it up and if that did anything for you. But yeah. um, again, because it's already malted, I just went with a single infusion. That way we weren't adding any additional variables into it. So, um, and by the way, Herzberger, criminally underrated hop, just as an aside. Yeah. Um, yeah. So after the boil, we chilled them down, racked them into sanitized fermenters. Um, the all barley malt uh, came out to about a 1049 OG, whereas the blue corn, just a little bit, little bit under 1044 OG, which I kind of expected. Yeah. So it's it, in my initial reading or, or the, what I was reading yesterday, I'm going, man, why is malted barley have a higher PPG or I'm sorry, a malted corn have a higher PPG than malted barley. But then what you explained to me from what you found on the text malt site, it makes sense that the blue corn malt batch would, would start with a slightly lower OG, about five specific gravity points, which sounds pretty drastic, but from, from our experience and our experiments may not be as big a deal, uh, you know, again, as people presume. Right. And I had to do some math to get those uh, numbers in there to, to predict it. So actually, when I when I did my yield percentage and all that stuff um, for the, the the ingredients for text malt, I originally don't think they defaulted in Brewfather. So I had to do a little bit of math. And so I was kind of proud because my predicted OGs kind of came out pretty close to what um, I had calculated in my calculator. So, uh, you know, a little pat, pat myself on the back right there. Um, so, <laughs> well, and so well that, be, before we move on, I think it's important to note, people are probably wondering, why didn't you just add more blue corn? to get it to 1049, that batch to 1049, because uh, the OG in, in this experiment is a function of the, var the variable. We wanted both batches to have identical amounts of grain in general. So we swapped out two pounds of Pilsner malt with two pounds of malted blue corn. So the way we're looking at it, and I know other people disagree and think there should be different ways of doing this and we should take a different approach, but the way we're looking at it is the OG is ultimately a function of the variable. That's our first finding is, oh, look, it is, it's not, you know, as powerful or as hot as the barley malt. So to me, that's a good thing that we, we've been able to kind of determine this in real life. Well, and, and pounds are something we can measure. They're a measurable um, quantitative difference, whereas like calculations, they, they can they can be off because they're just a calculation. So um, so again, I think it's better to go with kind of the hard measurable uh, difference versus, you know, maybe trying to calculate it out and see what's different. But, you know, may, maybe in the future. If we want to introduce multiple variables, uh, we could go that route. But, you know, I, I, I'm pretty happy with, with what we did here. And, and again, five points at the end of the day. If I'm off by five points, I don't lose too much sleep over it. So, nope. All right. So after this, I pitched a single pouch of Imperial Yeast L13 Global into each batch. Uh, beers are fermented in my temperature controlled. Uh, you know, I have basically a fermentation chamber, which is an upright freezer with an ink bird on it. Uh, and that was done at 64F. Um, and you know, which was a week before taking hydron register, showed a slight difference in the final gravity. Um, and so the all barley malt final gravity was 1010 and the blue corn malt was 1011. So that's interesting uh, because what this indicates is that not only did it start at a lower OG, the blue corn malt batch, uh, but when fermented it at 64 Fahrenheit or 18 C, attenuation was also a bit more poor uh, than the barley malt one that started higher and finished a point lower. So uh, you had really nice attenuation. I, don't, I didn't calculate the exact percentage, but really nice attenuation on that barley malt batch. Very predictable. It's what you know we, we know very well because that's what we've been doing for so long. Um, whereas the one with just 18 percent blue corn malt really had an impact on the OG as well as the attenuation. I mean, it didn't even get down to 1010 like the all barley malt batch. To me, yet another finding that's very interesting. 
Yeah, again, I, I don't think the yield percentage in the blue corn, I, I do think that is something that uh, you have to take into account when you're designing these recipes because it just isn't going to get quite the sugars in there that you're expecting. Uh, you really have to just kind of be mindful of that and just know what you're using. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. So at this point, the beers were pressure transferred to CO2 purge kegs and placed in uh, a keg grader where they were allowed to condition for a couple of weeks before they were ready for evaluation. Woohoo! Before we get to that, though, why don't you tell us how you or what you felt about these beers and how you did on your own series of semi-blind triangle tests? Well, um, so so when you looked at them before I got into the plastic cup kind of thing, you know, they, they look super similar. Um, you know, the blue corn was a touch darker than the all malt version, which I found a little bit surprising. But, you know, uh, they aren't terribly far off. It's not yeah. like, you know, they're one's pitch black and the other one's, you know, fizzy yellow. Um, and, you know, so so it wasn't too far off. But, you know, when I went and sat down and did my blind triangle test, which I did five triangle tests, I only got the correct beer two out of five times. So mm. to me, these beers tasted the same. Uh, they were both delicious, both crushable. Hershbrooker is a great hop for the style. And uh, unfortunately, I just I couldn't tell the difference. That's despite almost uh, just a bump over, I believe, a 0.5%. It was like about 0.8% difference in OG, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and you still couldn't tell them apart. And you knew exactly what was different between these beers, not just in terms of the ingredient, but the OG and the FG as well. Uh, and yet two out, of times that, two out of five times that you said were just random guesses. Um, what does that say to you? I mean, I, you know, I, I get data like that and I know that there are people out there who are like, nah, crappy palate, duh, this is proof that it's crappy. And yet they've never attempted such a, <laughs> you know, such a test themselves. But what, what does that say to you about, um, you know, this ingredient malted blue corn in general or the impact that, that malted corn in, it has on beer? I mean, so, you know, I, I'm a little bit on the fence because I do think it's cool that we have this like kind of traditional American ingredient. I think it's cool that people are malting it. Um, you know, there could be some other benefits. Um, you know, if you look at the pictures that the head retention on one is just a little bit better for the blue corn than the other one. Um, and that could be just a function of when I poured them because, you know, yeah. you can't pour them at the same time. But, you know, so I wonder if there's some other benefits that I'm just not, uh, you know, privy to at all. But, you know, in all honesty, it's kind of like, you know, is it worth having an extra ingredient around? Maybe. Yeah. That, so that's kind of where I'm at. And this is just your, based off of your impressions alone. We're going to get into the blind taster results, which, ooh, maybe they're different. They're not. Um, I'm looking at these beers right now, uh, the picture of them. And yeah, you know, the malted blue corn one does look, I mean, by a touch darker, we're talking not even a full degree. I mean, it, they look basically identical. Uh, obviously, st you know, stats wise, they're not. You know, one is more strong than the other. The all barley malt one is stronger than the other. But you, could, you couldn't tell them apart fully knowing everything that was different between them. That to me is very telling. So that's the reason we serve these to blind tasters as well, though. People often ask like, why don't you tell people what the variable is? That way they can focus. Well, p part of the beauty of blind tasting is that they can't focus. It's We're asking you know, regular beer drinkers, hey, did this thing that we're testing have an impact? So in this case, you served it to 24 participants. This is a triangle test. Three beers, two are identical, one is different, and their job is simply to pick out the one that they perceive as being different. In order for us to say that there was a meaningful difference or a, some semblance of a meaningful difference uh, caused by the variable, out of those 24 participants, 13 would have had to identify the unique sample in order for us, again, to say that there was a, a difference that seemed to have mattered, right? Uh, in, in the end, only nine people did. I mean, that is 38%. That's not too far off from what we'd expect from people randomly guessing. So what we can say for, from this in a technical sense is that people were unable to reliably distinguish these beers. We can't say why. We can't say that the beers were identical. We know they weren't. But 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 it does send some sort of a sign, some sort of a message that the blue corn malt just didn't seem to have much of an impact on the perceptible qualities of an international pale lager. And by that, we mean mouthfeel and body, aroma and flavor. Absolutely fascinating, particularly when you consider the difference in strength. Yeah, you know, and and that's kind of one of those things that, you know, I. I Maybe if you upped it, maybe you could get more of that uh, flavor component. Obviously, you'd have a bigger delta on your uh, your original gravities if you if you still did the one to one. Um, and so maybe you could argue that that drives it. Um, you know, or may, maybe 
the way I'm using it isn't the proper way. If it's not, then somebody please send me an email. Um, because again, this is kind of my first, uh, you know, tackling with this ingredient. Um, but you know, I have to say all that, all that aside, you know, am I going out of my way to buy malted blue corn? Maybe, maybe not. I think it's kind of cool that you're looking at a, a very historic American ingredient and that having a malted format kind of has some kind of romantic appeal to me, if not a, um, you know, perceptible appeal. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, you know, I, I look at this data, this information and, you know, the way that I take it is, you know, am, am I going to go out and seek out malted blue corn? <laughs> no, I promise you that. Uh, would I pick some up if I was at the homebrew shop and I was making a cream ale and I saw it there for maybe 50 cents more per pound than flaked maize? Probably, um, because why not? And I love the idea of supporting small businesses, which these maltsters are. Uh, and so for that reason alone, I think it's fun and it's unique to be able to have ingredients like this to, uh, you know, at our disposal to use however we want. But in the end, uh, my go-to is still probably going to be flaked maize that you can buy at uh, the homebrew shop for very cheap or even you know, corn grits, quick grits, because it works seemingly, I mean, arguably better if you're using it for lightening up a beer, uh, you know, without contributing much flavor, aroma or mouthfeel, but wanting to get more strength. That's kind of where I'm at with it. And um, I, again, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, minimize the rad impact that these craft maltsters are having. I think it's super cool that we have access to this stuff, that they're paying farmers to grow this stuff, and then they're making it so that we can use it in beer. Um, that in and of itself is, is a good enough excuse to keep using it, at least in my opinion. Will, I, again, you're not going to be going out and seeking out, you know, boutique malted grain, malted corns at this point, I suspect. Well, it is pretty rad to say that my blue corn came from the same fields that provide the blue corn tortilla <laughs> chips. I'm it just sure saying does. that's 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 kind of a pretty rad thing to throw in there. That's also something you could tell somebody and they're like, OK, dude, uh, I'll, I'll just take your word for it because you don't see it in the beer. You don't taste it. You don't see it. You don't feel it. So it really is just kind of bragging rights, which by all means will brag, brag away. So, well, we did get one comment that I wanted to, that I wanted to read on the show. It comes from Eric Branshaw, who said, I'd be interested to see a comparison between flaked maize and malted corn. Uh, in my experience, malted corn tastes closer to malt than corn. I get little of the sweet corn flavor I get from flaked corn and more of the toast-like flavor similar to something like Vienna malt, although I'm sure that that varies from malt to malt depending on the kilning time and temp. I believe we've done a flaked maize to uh, to barley malt experiment, haven't we? And I don't believe that came back significant, did it? Uh, I don't believe it did either, but we've never compared malted corn to flaked maize. In fact, you are the one who is the most <laughs> equipped to do that at this point, Will, if you, if you care to. But like you, I mean, it, it, you know, the, if the flaked maize experiment that we did return non-significant results, as you and I both suspect, uh, there are over 500 experiments. We can't remember the results to all of them off the top of our head. If that's the case, then it, it you know, kind of, you got to ask yourself, what's the purpose in comparing these two if neither of them seem to have much of an, uh, of an impact anyways? I mean, we do meaningless comparisons uh, as a part of Brulosophy, so maybe it's in our future. Who knows? You know, I, I'm game to try it. I need ideas. And anytime I can just, you know, make a crushable lager just for, for fun and do something like this, I'm game. Yeah, no one's complaining about having a bunch of easy drinking pale lager on tap <laughs> in their in their kegerator. So, well, that does bring us to the end of this episode. I believe we covered about as much as we possibly can on the beauty that is malted blue corn, whether it has much of a perceptible impact or not. Did you have any final words on brewing with blue corn malt, Will? I've said this several times, you know, corn, it gets a bad rap. I think we really need to just kind of embrace it as, as our new world brewing tradition, as our new world ingredient. And we just need to like kind of roll with it because it, it is something that is traditional to the Americas. It goes all the way back to um, the, the Incas. So let's just let's just embrace this ingredient for what it is in, in any format that we have and, you know, roll with it. Yeah. Hey, look, I'm not much uh, of one for giving advice. I'll, you know, that's kind of not in my realm. I don't like to tell people how to do things or that I've got the right way to do it. But if you've been struggling to make a crushable, you know, light bodied double or triple IPA with all of that hop character, but without that syrupy a mouthfeel to it, grab yourself some, some corn, whether it's corn malt or flaked maize or grits, use it at about 20% of your, you could even use dextrose, just corn sugar. Uh, use it at about 20% of your grist, no joke, with some Pilsner malt, and then do, do the rest of your double IPA recipe the same. I'm telling you, it's, it's better than it sounds. So, well, uh, that does bring us to the end of the episode. Don't forget to check out our newest podcast, The Brew Lab, where host Kate Job takes you into the lab with real brewing scientists to discuss the fascinating research they've done on our favorite beverage and 
as always, you can read more about the experiment we discussed by clicking the link to the article on brewlosophy.com in the description of this episode. The Brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it soothes my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle man no more.